So without further ado, our first speakers are Elizabeth Downs and Matt Coleman. They both serve on the Principal Gifts team in communications, and they both, ironically, got their start in writing at, in the same year from the same high school in the same paper. And that, I believe, is what makes the Gator Nation so small and so fantastic. Anyway, so that was the Daytona Beach News Journal. I needed to know, so I asked. But um, anyway, please welcome Matt Coleman and Elizabeth Downs. Thank you, Meg. All right. How many of you have sat in front of a blank Word document to write something and your brain locks? But the thing is, you have a deadline. You need to write something. So you might just stop, check out, try again a little later. You might just reuse that old template. Or you might just continue to stare. My colleague Matt and I are here today to try to help you in that moment. We want to open your eyes to a new take on the writing process and your powerful role in it. In a previous life, I worked at the University of Delaware's Writing Center serving everyone from first semester freshmen to faculty. And the thing that helped them, each and every one of them, was putting their audience at the center of their writing. And when they put their audience, whether that's a fellow staff member, a partner, or a donor, at the center of their writing, they began to focus on what their audience cares about, what they already know, and what they won't understand. It is then that you have a partner in your writing. Moreover, your priorities in writing begin to shift. You care about what they care about, and not solely on what you feel you need to communicate. It is then that you can filter out the dozens of other voices that influence your writing. Your faculty, your chairs, your boss, their boss, the UF templates, the UF website, through the lens of your audience's needs. This is when things get fun. This is when you take on a new identity. Writer as gatekeeper. This is the mindset Matt and I want to discuss with you today. This is when you, as the writer, decide what your audience is going to receive and how they will receive it. This is you opening certain gates and closing others as you exchange information with your fellow colleagues, your partners, and your donors. This is intentional. This is effective. This is empowering. In order to illustrate this, I'd like to share with you an effective example written by my predecessor on the new chemistry building. I'm going to highlight for you ways she served as a gatekeeper in her own writing. So first off, she quickly sets the scene, zeroes in on the main idea, the facilities were unsuitable for 21st century teaching and research. She then summarized the struggles in four crisp bullet points, quickly getting through there. Honestly, these bullet points blow my mind. Just imagine with me the number of conversations this writer had to wade through with frustrated faculty, frustrated staff, students, leadership, etc. And she boiled it all down into four quick bullets. And then more than that, she frames the entire conversation in a positive way. She says, all of this is because of the department's productive track record and accomplishments. When you own your role as a gatekeeper, like this writer did, you begin to, um, you begin to focus on what that audience member needs. And you filter out the other information and you move forward in a positive, direct, efficient manner. More than that, um, you begin to get excited about the work that you have to do in engaging with your audience. You serve as a gatekeeper in a new way. Now all this is beginning to sound kind of exciting, right? You know, I'm going to take this stuff, I'm going to move away from this passive collating and then just sending information on into an active role of really defining the experience an audience has with my materials, making it a curated, targeted, thoughtful approach that will leave them wanting more. That's the goal here. But we have to be honest. There are barriers to overcome. So let's just talk about it for a second. What stops us? First of all, time. 
We all have to admit it's sometimes a little bit easier to copy and paste what a faculty member sends us or the information on a website than it is to go through it and truly pinpoint what the audience's passion points are. Secondly, we all experience stakeholder pressure. We work with our chairs, our faculty, every day. And they expect to see things in a certain way. We, while we might not always win these battles, even small steps matter as we work to target our audience, the donor or a staff member. Thirdly, we're just used to it. As we work with our units on a day-to-day -day basis, we become accustomed to their history, their acronyms, their language. It's second nature to us, but it is not always second nature to our partners and our donors. Fresh eyes, as my colleague Matt will discuss in a moment, are key. Matt joined us this past summer from Georgetown University. And serving as a gatekeeper in his writing was critical for him refining messages for one of our top prospects. Thank you, Elizabeth. Now, as my colleague just mentioned, I'm a relatively new member of the UF community. And I say this objectively, and not as someone accustomed to messaging for university. But UF size and its scope, it's truly breathtaking. Just take a look. Our students, our faculty, our staff, they're so well-versed and so gifted in so many different areas that it's really a treasure trove of content for a communicator. But with this breadth, this depth, and the hundreds of corresponding acronyms that go along with it, it can sometimes make it a little bit difficult to focus on what truly matters to your audience. Now that's where this idea of the gatekeeper comes into play. For Elizabeth and myself, we're in principal gifts. We're often writing for an audience of one. That effectively narrows our scope. It allows us to see things through a different lens, the donor's lens. Now this, uh, this targeted approach can help you in your own day-to-day -day writing, whether it's putting together a concept paper, a proposal, or simply writing an email to a donor. Let your audience be your North Star. Serve as a gatekeeper by curating content for that audience. And ask yourself a few targeted questions before ever putting pen to paper. What makes your audience passionate? What animates them? How do they want to leave a legacy? Now I'll tie this into an example. My second day on the job, I was tasked with laying some of the communications foundation for a $100 million fundraising initiative tied to brain cancer research. No pressure for a first assignment, right? Just $100 million fundraising. Uh, we now refer to this as the Remission Alliance. And our lead donor was an Orlando businessman named Harris Rosen. Harris's son, Adam, was receiving treatment at UF Health for a brain tumor. And Harris was focused on a few key aspects of our work, on collaboration, on cutting edge research, on rewriting the story of brain cancer, and ultimately finding a cure for patients like his son. Unfortunately, Adam succumbed to that brain tumor in November, but Harris's passion for the Remission Alliance, it didn't wane. By working with colleagues from UF Health, by serving as a gatekeeper for Harris's specific interests, and curating a piece that was emotional and impactful, we were able to secure a $12 million investment to help jumpstart the Remission Alliance. As you can see from the concept paper excerpt on the screen, this writing really focused on four key aspects that were integral to Harris. Collaborative research, long-term survival, groundbreaking progress, and quality of life. Now this project was very much a team effort involving multiple stakeholders from across campus. But the writing itself, it benefited from this narrow scope, this curated approach using gatekeeping as a mechanism to tell a story that would make sense to Harris specifically, an audience of one. Now Elizabeth will share a few tactics that you can take away from, the, from our presentation today to help you feel more empowered in your own writing. Elizabeth? Thank you, Matt. So what does all of this look like in your real life? I'm going to share with you a piece of advice I learned from my mentor over in the J School. He taught all of his students that every single sentence we wrote had to engage the reader, that we were literally earning their attention for the next sentence. This might seem over the top, but I promise it's true. 
How many magazine articles have you just set down after reading two paragraphs? They didn't earn your attention. How many emails did you never even open because the subject line didn't grab you? When you serve as a gatekeeper, you have the power to deeply engage your reader with every sentence you write. You can earn their attention. All you have to do is take some steps. Oh yeah, it's an acronym. <laughs> so S, simplify the language. Is there any jargon anywhere that you could cut or write in a different way? T, target the donor or any audience member, a fellow staff or another partner. Think about what this individual cares about. Write that down and then bend all the language to hit those particular passion points. E, edit irrelevant details. If there's something in there that's not gonna move the conversation forward, cut it and instead think about putting it in a follow-up email or saying it verbally instead. Propose alternatives. If there's something in a given document just because a stakeholder wanted to see it there, could you summarize it into a few brief bullet points or an easy to read chart? Or could you refer the donor or the individual to a website instead? S, streamline the whole document. Okay, so put your gatekeeper hat on one more time. Read every subhead, every headline, every caption. Is there anything you need to kick out behind the gate? Is there anything that you've forgotten that you need to get through the gate? The next time you're confronted with this blank Word document, I encourage you to consider taking just a few of these steps for becoming a gatekeeper in your writing and putting the audience at the center of your work. Will this make you a professional writer? The honest answer is, is no. But Matt and I firmly believe that each and every one of us can take a few steps toward improving our writing, whether that's in an email, a letter, concept paper, or a proposal. At the end of the day, this entire presentation has aimed at helping you feel that you have more agency to define the experience your donor, your audience, will have with your materials, and ultimately, with our university. This is truly exciting work that we engage in each and every day. And it's a powerful place to be in. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Elizabeth. That was great. I, I'm taking away my steps, definitely. But if I'm counting steps, I definitely have steps now in my writing. Any questions for Matt and Elizabeth? Anyone? Joe. So when you said um, an audience of one, I thought you were going to put Tom's picture up there. <laughs> um, I'm being only marginally facetious because I'm getting to a compliment here too. I think one of the things both of you have done extraordinarily well is earn the trust of academics who are not the, the easiest audience. So react to that, this idea of an audience of one, how you work with them, what steps you've taken, because I think that's something for all of us that sit in the academic units. This is a piece of it when we introduce you into the conversation it requires some degree of trust or go forward on that. I think the first thing is to be a good listener, that you earn trust even as you're engaging in the interview process and you're gathering information. Um, sorry. I think before you even um, begin to engage in the editing process, an important part of trust building is listening well and, and taking people's contributions very seriously and yet also setting very clear parameters from the get-go. The fact is, is that not everything we discuss today is going to make it ultimately into the proposal. But understanding the details is a valuable part of being able to communicate this effectively to audiences who might not share your values. So introducing them to the fact that they value certain things that your ultimate audience might not value, sensitizing that from the get, sensitizing them to, to that from the get-go, and then walking them through a process of approvals where you're comfortable explaining the choices you've made. Not just presenting something like, here's the final version, but I took what you said, I summarized it into a few bullet points. I think we've hit on the donor's passion points. What do you think? And just to build on what Elizabeth said uh, about listening, we're both coming from the perspective of being former journalists and a key aspect of that was interviewing subjects, different people, really getting their 
own background, their own view on things. And we try to take that skill and use that when communicating with, with faculty members, with, uh, with DOs, to make sure that we're getting the accurate, accurate picture of what they want to convey to a donor, uh, making them our partners in this work. It's very much a collaboration, and I would hope that anyone who's worked with us to this point it can take that away from that experience, that we want to be uh, your partner in this work. We are not writing in a vacuum. We want to be uh, the, the assistance, the, the help, the, able to supplement the work that you are doing to really convey a clear, concise message to our donors, and one that will be impactful for them, and hopefully get them to invest in the university. around the 